We're going to be in 1 Samuel 13, beginning in verse 15. So picking up where we left off last week. Um, let's begin with a, uh, a prayer. I'll wait just a, a moment on that so you guys can get your Bibles and your Bible apps open to 1 Samuel 13. If everything goes the way I plan, we'll get into chapter 14 today too. So that'll be that'll be fun, I think. All right, 1 Samuel 13, 15 is where we're going to start. Let's begin with a prayer. Father, thank you for um, in so many ways not leaving us alone in this world. Uh, you've sent your son to live perfectly as a human die for us and he is now at your right hand ever interceding for us ever praying for us you've left your Holy Spirit Christ's Spirit dwelling in us and among us and you've left us your word in scripture with a record for us to see of your faithfulness to saints and generations past. For all of this, we thank you. And we pray that we would take your word to heart, that our hearts would be soft so the Holy Spirit could write your word on them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Okay, I want to sum up a bit. Um, where we're coming from from last week now Saul's forces in this case led by his son Jonathan had this short-lived victory over the Philistines uh, if you remember they were able to capture a Philistine garrison but when the Philistines answered back right they they, they cornered Saul's army and the people were hiding in caves they were hiding down wells they were hiding in tombs. Some had even deserted. So, of course, what did Saul do? He took matters into his own hands. He offered a sacrifice that only the priests were authorized to make. And Samuel, who is uh, the priest and prophet of Israel, right, catches Saul in the act of, of making this sacrifice and told him that because of his sin... God was removing his dynasty, and God had already, in fact, selected a replacement king. 1 Samuel 13, 14 tells us that God had chosen a man after his own heart. Of course, we know that that man is going to be King David. A man after someone, uh, God's own heart is someone who will obey God's will. A true king... For God's people receives God's approval by his life of faithful submission to God. Now what, we, what we're seeing in the story that we heard last week is that God gave Saul the opportunity to be that kind of man. To be that kind of king after God's own heart. And Saul failed. You see, like Adam... Saul reached beyond the limits that God had established. And is Adam's legacy to all of his sons and daughters, and that's what, that's all of humanity, right? As Adam's legacy to all of his sons and daughters became exile from God's gracious presence and, and finally death, that's what would also happen to Saul's household, right? They, they would lose the kingdom, and they would die. Saul's replacement with King David, the man after God's own heart, and I didn't get to get into this last week, and I kind of wanted to, so I'm doing it this week. Saul's replacement by King David, who is a man after God's own heart, is a foreshadowing of the gospel. Remember I tell you that Jesus is on every page? It's a foreshadowing of the gospel in this way. 
Christ has replaced Adam as our head, as our, you know, the good guy we're all kind of born in and die in. Uh, if someone will turn to Romans chapter 5 and read verses 12 through 19, because that's telling the story of how we were all part of Adam's lost, exiled, dead dynasty, but God raised up Christ for us to be our true king. Romans 5, 12 through 19, who's got that? I've never had people less enthusiastic to read it. Yeah, Romans 5, 12 through 19. Yeah. Thank you. So what, what story is that, those verses that Ray Lynn just read telling? Yeah. And, and so kind of where, where you can see this foreshadowing of, of the gospel in the Saul and David story, like I'm saying, if you know if you know the the history of First Samuel or just you know from Bible class, what ends up happening to Jonathan and all of Saul's family basically? What's that, Ella? Yeah, they're, they're, they yeah they they either die or they're totally exiled, right? And so that is that is the state of humanity in Adam, right? We're we're all Adam's sons and daughters. And so King David comes, and of course now he ushers in this new age of righteousness and blessing and that kind of thing. Well, in the same way that, that uh, Adam, who is the king who has failed, right, has been replaced by Christ as the king for believers. Christ is this righteous man after God's own heart, perfectly righteous. See, and that's the, that's the other part I want to say, is that the story of Saul and David is only a foreshadowing of the gospel, right? Because David is still a sinner. He cannot bring salvation and eternal life to God's people. 
So, of course, who is, the, who is the true man after God's own heart that we're all looking for? Jesus. See, that Bible answer, that Bible class answer, you know, of Jesus, like Jesus is always the answer, that's true. You just got to understand how to show your work, you know, if you're thinking in math terms there. It's always, it's always right, but you just got to gotta know how to show your work, see. Um, and here, here's the beautiful thing about it, too. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we get Christ? Like, how do we get a share in what Christ has done? How do we receive Christ? By, by grace through faith, right? Yeah. Yeah, by grace through faith. So here's the beautiful thing, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the message today. In Christ, by faith, believers, you, me, we, we gradually become more and more men and women after God's own heart. That's that, that word, that big word I like to use, sanctification, which just means being made holy. Over the course of our Christian life, as we grow and mature in faith and we grow and mature in the gospel, we become, we become more and more men after, and women after God's own heart. But that's not something we can do on our own, is it? That's because we are in Christ who is truly the man after God's own heart. I want, to, I want to talk a little bit, too, about an application of King Saul here. What, again, was King Saul's sin? What did he do? Right. So he's, he's trying to gain the Lord's... Right? They're, they're, I mean, they're in a bad situation, right? They're, they're cornered by the Philistine army. He's got people deserting. Right? They're in a really bad situation. But he's trying to, to gain the Lord's favor by taking matters into his own hands, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, of course, and, and part of the issue with that is they weren't, they weren't carrying the ark the way the Lord told them to carry the ark. I mean, you know. But, yeah, I mean, here's, here's the thing. Yeah, I mean, when you see, when you see, because here's, here's the thing that we often do. You know, you're reading the Bible and, you know, you meet, you know, here's little King David and he's got his slingshot and he's fighting Goliath and you want to put yourself in the spot of King David. And the actual spot that, that we are in we're the Israelites who, who can't fight Goliath, you know. Um, you know, in a situation like this, a lot of times we read and we go, well, how could, how could you know, because I'm glad you brought that up because, you, you know, you go, well, how could Saul do that? Like you said, if, most of us probably would have ended up doing the same thing. <laughs> um, but... Uh, and, and, that, that's, and that's revealing something, too, because what Saul did, was that an act of faith or was it an act of a lack of faith? Okay, explain. I think you're right, but... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. I think, I think you're absolutely right. And I think how, how many of us have done that? Oh yeah, that's, that's real human. 
Um, I think that's part of it. I think another part of it is, I mean, why is, why is Saul, why does he decide I need to perform these sacrifices? Like, what is he trying to accomplish? What is he trying to get from God when he does that? A favor, right? Because he, he's like, okay, well, if I do this, then maybe God will swoop in and rescue us, right? So what's he trying to do? Yeah. It's like he's trying to it's like he's trying to manipulate God by being religious. Like and don't you know, have you ever been in a situation where you were kind of going through a tough time and so you decided, well, you know, things are not going right, so I'm going to pray more and I'm going to read my Bible more and I'm going to uh, you know, go out and do some extra good work. Have you ever done that before? You ever you've never been in that situation? That's just me. No, you've all done it, right? Yeah. Well, isn't that what King Saul's basically doing here? Like he's trying to goad God into action by, right, stepping up and being, being yeah, that's right, by being religious. Here, and here's the thing. It was actually, you guys are right, it was lack of faith. How often do we think that the way to God, the way to get God's attention is in our striving and in our working and what we do, but in fact, our striving is actually what is our undoing. Yeah, that happens a lot, right, Charmaine? That's, and it's lack of faith. It really, because, like, I was, I was talking with Jacob the other day, and he, he said, man, you might, you might should drop this because he liked this. So, um, you know, if you, don't, if you don't like it, when he comes back, you can be like, hey, Jacob, why'd you tell Jeremy to say that? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't do that to him. I love Jacob. Um, I said, you know, a lot of times, here's the, here's the difference when you, when you understand the gospel, when you understand that it's the good news, it's God's promise to save his people, and it's not based on anything in us, and it's not, it's not based on what we do. When you, when you move into that realm where you understand this is by grace through faith, and not of works lest anyone should boast, here's the beautiful thing that it does for you. Instead of struggling to be free, right, you are now set free to struggle. And what, what I mean by that is you're not trying to strive to do a bunch of stuff to get in God's favor or stay in God's favor or be saved or stay saved or anything like that. But like, here's the deal. We live in a Genesis 3 world. What do I mean by that? Fallen, sinful a world of, of, of disease and pollution and disappointment and war and violence and heartbreak and all that stuff, right, and disease that comes along with it. And we live in Genesis 3 bodies, right, that by nature choose sin. By nature now are all marching inexorably toward death, right? Life is a struggle, is it not? And a lot of people, I think, they think because when you become a Christian that suddenly the struggles will get easier. Has that been your experience? What? That people think that, but it's not, that's not real life, right? I want to explain to you what the being free to struggle means, because here's what I think a lot of times we do not understand about the Christian life. In Romans 7, Paul talks about, and I'm sorry, I'm way off the, I'm way off the grid here, but I, this is important. In Romans 7, you know, Paul does that whole thing where he says, the, the good that I want to do, I don't do it. And I don't do the, you know, I do the bad that I don't want to do. 
Now, when Paul wrote that, was, it was, he, was he talking about before when he was a Christian? Like, no, because he says, right now, this is my life. Paul writes these words, he's like in his 50s or 60s, man. I mean, like, this is toward the end of his life and ministry. He's a mature Christian. He's an apostle. He's writing scripture, and he's saying, I struggle with sin like this every day. Here's what we don't understand. Every one of us, every day, has got a civil war going on in us. Because we live in these sinful bodies of flesh, right? And until we are glorified in resurrection, you know, until the day we die and then we're resurrected when Christ returns, we're going to continue to live <laughs> in corruptible, perishable bodies that are prone to not only disease and decay, but also to sin. But we also have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that's constantly right, saying, you know what, you shouldn't ought to do that. You should ought to do this, you know? <laughs> and convicting us and reminding us of God's word. So there's always that struggle going on in every believer. And when I say set free to struggle, here's what I mean. You do not need to be some perfect, shiny, happy, clappy saint to be assured of your salvation, be assured of God's love for you. And the really good news is, is the fact that you struggle with your sin at all is actually a sign that you are saved. Because if you did not struggle with your sinful impulses, you wouldn't care, right? You see the difference? So there's actually like this glorious freedom that we've been set free to struggle. And that is going to highlight, I think, what is the fundamental difference between David and Saul. And I'm going on this knowing that you guys all know the story of King David. You know, this is not new, this part to you. Morally speaking, just in terms of the course of David's life, is he a better man than Saul? You could argue that David's actually a bigger scoundrel than Saul is, right? In a lot of ways. The difference between them is faith. The difference between them is faith. In this occasion, Saul demonstrated his faithlessness. David, we see, throughout his whole life, even when he is spectacularly failing, in doing things that, you know, he would be under church discipline for. <laughs> David is a man of faith, and that is the difference between him and Saul. And it's like Hebrews 11.6 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. No matter what you do, how much you do, how good you do at it, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. All right. What do you guys feel about that? Struggle? Yeah. Yeah. The only reason that we can do any good is because is because we have a the Holy Spirit in us who's you know writing God's law on our hearts, but also B like think about this. Isaiah sixty four six says that your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. 
the only reason, because like, here's the deal, even as Christians, your best works on your best day are tainted by sin. You're never going to have pure motivations. You're, you're just, you're not. Not totally. So, you are in Christ, and because you're in Christ, that's what makes your good works holy. Not, you know, and that's, once again, that's by faith. So, yeah, that's true, Oscar. And once again, the struggle there is, you know, before, we, we didn't want to do God's will, right? Now we want to, but we often find that we don't. But like I said, the struggle itself is actually this really wonderful sign of that there is a true living faith with a heartbeat in you. you know, it's when people don't struggle and think, oh man, I'm fine, <laughs> that I would worry. So, 1 Samuel 13. Um, oh, I forgot to get the clicker. Mike, can you advance for me, please? Thank you. Verses 15 through 18. So, and Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. So this is right after he's told Saul, hey dude, you, you biffed it. <laughs> and so God's going to take the kingdom from you and give it to somebody else. Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned toward Oprah, or Orpah. Um, I, wonder if that, I think it's where Oprah Winfrey got her name from. To the land of Shual, I'm not kidding, I think her mom got out of the Bible. To the land of Shual, another company turned toward Beth Horon, and another company turned toward the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now, I could not find a good map for this section that you could see this on. But basically, what the Philistines did was they sent out raiding parties on all sides of the Israelites. And so what's going on here is they've got Saul and Jonathan and their army now cornered in the very garrison that Jonathan had had taken earlier. Because if you if you look at uh, verse 16, right? And Saul and Jonathan, his son, and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin. Look back at like verse, uh, I think verse uh, 3. That is the Philistine garrison that uh, Jonathan had captured. So now, my point being, at the site where they had had their initial victory, now they're what? They're trapped there. They, they can't get out because the Philistines have sent these raiding parties out. And, and basically surrounded them. Also, look at verse 15. What's Saul's army down to now? 600. Where did he start? Yeah. So, that, that tells you how many people have now deserted from Saul. So, in, the, in this piece... He's actually in, in worse shape than he was before he decided to go play priest. Do you see that? I mean, he's, he's, they're in a mess. They are, they are now trapped. And I just, this is so ironic, right? This place where Jonathan had this great initial victory, now they're all just trapped there. They can't get out. And now things are, are going to go from bad to worse. Let's pick up here and read uh, from 19 to 23. 
Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare, his mattock. A mattock is basically a pickaxe. His axe or his sickle. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and for the mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. So on the day of the battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan, but Saul and Jonathan his son had them. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Tom, do you, do you have any idea how the Philistines were able to keep there from being blacksmiths in Israel? Yeah, this is, you're right. It, Tom said that they basically controlled, if you want to use the Marx terms, the means of production. <laughs> they, they had a monopoly over all the stuff that you need to do to do uh, metal work. And in fact, archaeology confirms this aspect of scripture because archaeology tells us that uh, what, what the archaeological digs have discovered is that the Philistines actually were masters at ironwork and metalwork and you know long before the Israelites. So they already had basically a monopoly on that market in that region. Um, but what they so what they're able to do here is I mean they've basically reduced Israel to serfdom. What is serfdom? What? Well, kind of. It's the Philistines are the are the are the enemies of Israel, right? Okay. When I grew up, here's a, here's an example. Um, I grew up in Alabama, and not when I grew up, but maybe like when my grandmother was growing up, you still had the cotton mills. Now, if you worked in the cotton mills, where did you live? No, you lived in housing that the cotton company pr provided for you. Right. And if you wanted to and if you wanted to buy something, could you just go to the Safeway and buy it? No, why, Tom? Yeah. They did not pay you in money. They paid you in scrip. And it on that scrip only worked at the company store. That's basically serfdom. It's, it's, it's a form of slavery. Mm -hmm. What's that, Ella? No, they didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right here, and here's my here's what I here's what's going on, and it, what what I think is going on, and I think this is what the text is trying to tell us. If you were an Israelite, you got a weapon by beating your plowshare into a sword. Right, remember the verse about beating your swords into plowshares. Well, if you went to 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 war, you did it the other way around. But if the Philistines, what's that, Ella? Yes, it does. Because mm -hmm. because once again, who's the only one equipped for battle in that story? Saul. 
And, and, and um, what the Philistines have essentially done here, A, just to carry on your farm work so you can live and subsist, you got to go to them to get your tools taken care of. But they're charging you ridiculous amounts of money. But the other part of it is, this is keeping the Israelites docile because you cannot now go to the Philistines and say, hey, beat this plowshare into a sword or this pruning hook into a spear. The Philistines have made it so that the Israelites, even if they wanted to fight, cannot raise up an army. That is... I... Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's, and I think you're absolutely right there, Tom. Jerry, in the answer to your question, my, my read of it, just from, and from what we know of, of biblical history, from what we know, they're basically out there. These are the ones who are like, man, we're, we, are, we are waiting for God to swoop in and deliver us and do this big thing. And they're, they're literally sitting there waiting. And we're going to see that as we go into chapter... 14, but it's interesting too, only Saul and Jonathan were equipped for battle. Mm. Uh huh. Mm hmm. Because we, we do that, don't we, Ella? When God, when God doesn't, huh? I do too. That's the, isn't, it, isn't it great, though, when we can be together in a Sunday morning Bible class and confess sins and struggles and nobody, like, nobody even judges each other for it? It's great. I love it. Because it's true. We are all, we're all bent that way. It's, it's very natural. Chapter 14. Um, actually, the end of chapter 13. Can I get the next slide, please, Mike? The end of chapter 13 is what's going to set us up for chapter 14. Because for now, right, Saul is still king, even though now his kingship has been severely limited. Israel is still the apple of God's eye. And uh, whoever touches the apple of God's eye, God says, I will surely raise my hand against them so that their slaves will plunder them. That's Zechariah chapter 2, 8 through 9. So for right now, for right now, the Philistines have reduced Israel to slavery. But God will send help so Israel can overthrow and plunder their enemies. Now is God going to do that because Israel's so righteous? No. Is God going to do that because Saul... Is, is just really hoping that he will? What, what's God's reason for it? Yeah. Yeah. They are, they are his people, and he is faithful even when we are faithless. By the way, this, uh, th th these verses, this story has nothing to do with the nation of Israel now. Um... If you read Romans 9 through 11 sometimes, who's the true Israel of God? The church. When Christ returns, 
He will plunder our enemies who have made us slaves, Satan, sin, and death. And we will join him in glory as what? More than conquerors. But 1 Samuel is going to show us a contrast between Jonathan and Saul, who are the only two men equipped for war, because Saul is still going to be acting faithlessly, and Jonathan is going to be acting in faith. Verses 1 through 5 of 1 Samuel 14. One day Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father Saul, who was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah. Uh, my translation says in the pomegranate cave. Does yours say pomegranate tree? Okay, I think pomegranate tree is the, is the right translation here, because who does that remind you of? Who, who would sit under a tree to rule the people? Didn't, didn't Deborah do that? Under some kind of oak or terebinth or something? The point, the point is, is that in that culture, it was, it was kind of natural for the leader to sort of shade themselves under the tree and kind of, right? I'm the king, I'm the boss, look at me. You know, I don't know if he had servants with palm branches, you know, like fanning him or anything, but that's the image that you're supposed to have. So sitting under the pomegranate tree at Migram. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. I love how it's like just putting that point home again. It's like rubbing his nose in it. <laughs> Including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. Now that is not just a random detail. Saul has got this, this dude, Ahijah, acting as his priest, right? He's wearing an ephod. Why is that a problem? Well, no, he is, he's, he's acting as a priest. And he's actually from a priestly line. So why is this a problem? He's from Eli's line. I know it's been a long time since we did the story of, of Eli, but what happened to Eli? Right. And, and he fell back. Yeah, he was fat and he fell backwards and broke his neck and died. But that's because God had pronounced this judgment on Eli's family because they were priests, but they were, his sons were corrupt. And so just like God has taken Saul's dynasty from him. That was God's way of taking Eli's dynasty from him, right? So what has Saul gone and done? Now in utter defiance of God's pronounced judgment, he's found this one distant relative of Eli's and made him the priest. I guess he's kind of like, well, if we need a priest, here's one, right? Here, you be a priest, now, it's interesting, and it makes the point that this guy is Ichabod's nephew. Does anybody know what the name Ichabod means? Well, yeah. The, yeah, the, the, na the, the name Ichabod means the glory has departed. See, the glory has departed from Saul. All right, and this is, this is not too far into his reign, is it? And the glory has departed from Saul. The presence of the Lord is not with Saul. And that's what this is telling you. Here's the contrast. I'm going to go on. So verse 4. The, the people did not know Jonathan had gone. By the way, that tells you how, how well the sentries were keeping watch when your general can sneak out and nobody notices. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Within the passes... Um, by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sineth. The one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. So, once again, like I told you, I couldn't find a great map, but here's the deal. So you've got the Israelite camp... And you've got the Philistine camp, 
And they've got what dividing them? These two, yeah, rocky crags. And by the way, Bozes, they have names, right? Bozes means slippery, and Sinach means thorny. So the Israelite army and the Philistine army, what are they not going to do? They're not going to try to, as an army, go through, because it's dangerous, right? Right. So what you're supposed to see, these, these camps are sitting here, and they've got these crags dividing them, and they're sort of like peeking over at each other, you know? Like, what's going on with those, what's going on with those guys? So here's Saul. He's equipped for war. What is Saul doing? He's in the shade with an illegitimate priest not doing nothing. Jonathan, meanwhile, is the other man who is equipped for war. And what does Jonathan do? Jonathan acts. He decides to go on a recon mission. And by the way, those 600 troops, what do they not have? Weapons. Yeah. Oh. So while Saul sits and stews, Jonathan acts. Now look at verse 6. This is where we're going to end today. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, so he goes out alone except for his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. I love that. He's, he's not pulling any punches, is he? He's basically saying, let's, let's go over there and see what those godless heathens are doing. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord by saving by many or by few. Here's why you see Jonathan is doing a good thing. Does Jonathan demand anything from God when he goes out? Or he doesn't follow his father's example in trying to manipulate God with religion. He goes out with this attitude. God has delivered us before by the hands of less than 600. <laughs> He's done, he's done it before with one person, right? Remember when, when the judge, Eglon, do you know that guy? Yeah, or Ehud, excuse me, yeah, Ehud. I got it mixed up. Eglon was what? Eglon was very fat. And Ehud basically snuck into Eglon's bathroom while he was on the potty and gutted him. Yeah, that is a great story. And... and and, and, and so one person, right? One person. And because he was oppressing the Israelites, God used one person, right? Who, was, who, who had nothing but a dagger on him. What about Jael with her tent peg? I love Jael. She's my girl. You want to talk about some biblical womanhood? Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, Jonathan goes out with this attitude that says, Maybe God has done it before. He might do it again. What is that? That's faith. See, Saul is just sitting there waiting on an answer. He has, and he's tried to do the thing where he's like, well, I acted, but what did he do? He was actually just trying to manipulate God, right? He was, Jonathan says, I'm going to do this little thing. I'm just going to step out and, and take a peek at the Philistines, right? Yeah. The, 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 here, you know, here's the beautiful thing, and I, and I need to get yeah, finished up here. But with faith, I love how the old Puritans defined it, and they said, faith is receiving and resting on Christ 
as he is offered in the gospel. And so there's three elements to biblical faith. The first is, as he is received in the gospel, you have to know that, you have to intellectually know the facts about Jesus, right? As the Bible gives him to you. The second is receiving it, right? You have to believe that those facts are true. That the eternal son became a human, lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death so that humans could be saved. But then resting in it is the third part. And resting is that you have to believe this is true for me. And when you believe this is true for me, that, that, that God is my Savior, that Christ is my Savior, what does that do for you? Then you move with a kind of confidence and boldness that you would not have had otherwise. Why? Because this is true for me. I always have a safety net, as it were. You know, we are not called, thinking of Jonathan's example here, we are not called to emulate the lives of Bible heroes. Why? Because they are also sinners like us. Who wants your kid to grow up and be like David? Not me. Who wants your kid to grow up and be like Samson? Not me. But is Samson's faith praised by the author of Hebrews? Yes. We are not called to emulate them per se. So, you know, don't necessarily, if you're in a situation like that, go and, 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 and put yourself in harm's way like Jonathan, right? He's Jonathan, you're not. What are you called to emulate with these people? Their faith. And in Jonathan's case, it comes down to simply trusting that God has done this before. We are God's people. Maybe God will do it again. Well, I'm going to go over and peek at the enemy. <laughs> so that's where I'm going to leave it today with Jonathan's act of faith. But you see this utter contrast, don't you, between Jonathan and his father here. And that's important. Because Jonathan's faith has led to action. Saul's lack of faith has now led him to what? Inaction. All right, so next week we will pick up with uh, probably uh, verse 7. Verse 7. So I might do it back up a little bit on verse 6, but we'll be picking up verse 7. I'll try to finish chapter 14 next week.